It's been a very long time. We've missed you here at the Wrestling Perspective. One of us has been sitting behind the mic, and the other one has been touring the UK. I'll let you guys guess which one. But either way, if they, yeah, if they can't guess it, it's Lars Fredrickson. What's up, buddy? I missed you. I missed you too, Dennis. I mean, I really did. And I've been missing doing this show because so much has happened in the world of professional wrestling, like mind-blowing shit. And, you know, I thought to myself, it's like one of my favorite shows, well, literally was the only show forever about professional wrestling on the radio or whatever, was my man here, Mr. Dave LaGreca, busted open, a uh, huge fan of the show, listen to it pretty much every morning. Um, and I'm super stoked that when my return from my glory in the United Kingdom, the conquering yet of another country, I don't even, I'm just trying to talk like a wrestler, but anyways, not doing a very good job, but I'm very happy. And as as I'm sure you are, Mr. Dennis uh, Farrell, that we got Mr. Dave LaGreca from Busted Open joining us today. First show back. Welcome, Dave. Uh, Thank you guys for having me. I'm a big fan. And I want want to get your take, Lars, and be honest here. Like, I wore your shirt to the interview. Like, for the show, I wore your shirt. So do you respect that? Or are you like, are you shitting me? Like, this guy's such a shill that he's wearing my shirt. No, because see, here's the thing. Like, I'm the type of guy that would go on the Busted Open and wear the Busted Open shirt to rep, you know. You know, now, if I was wearing that shirt, that's where I would have the problem. So to me, you're kind of like family, Dave. So it's it's the equivalent of like my cousins in Denmark all showing up to the Rancid show with the exact same Rancid T-shirt on. You know what I mean? So to me, it's 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 like out of love. You know what I mean? Well, so, and, and that's exactly I, I why I wore it. It's out of love. I wasn't trying to shill. I wasn't trying to be a kiss ass. Like I really just I love supporting. So this is my way of supporting. So. Well, and that and that and but that's the thing. It's like that's what we I love about your your show is that you're basically a wrestling fan. You know, you obviously had other jobs in the industry. You know, in different industries, and I want to you know talk a little bit about that. But basically, you know, you've had a you know this show's been around ten years. It's going to be 13 uh, in April. Okay, so a decade-long wrestling show. I mean, just getting people to show up for a fucking podcast once <laughs> once a week is hard enough, right? But you guys do it every single day. So, you know, there's been so many people that you've had on your show. And I guess, you know, the obvious question is, what's your favorite or who's your favorite? But, like, when you – what my question would be is, you know, you're starting the show. You have this whole idea. Um, you know, who was the first guest that you felt like made your show legit? Mark Henry. And Mark Henry was our first guest. Like he was our, our first like real guest that we've ever had. And, and when I first started, it was myself and Doug Mortman, who's another Uber wrestling fan, who's gone on to be a big VP executive with Sirius XM now, but he was my original partner when we started in 2009 but Mark Henry and Mark Henry was just like you, just a fan of the show. And when he was starting to wind down his career and that was WrestleMania 32 in Texas, Mm. I wound up having about a two hour conversation with him in the lobby of the hotel he was staying at. And I said, Hey, whenever you decide to hang up the boots, give me a call and we'll make something happen. And, you know, now he's a permanent part of the show, but he was really to answer your question, the first like legit big guest that we ever had on Busted Open. Lars, who was ours? Probably Kurt Angle. I was a big one. Kurt you, Angle's a big you were, one. You were, you were, you were number one, I think, Lars. No, no, but I, I would say Kurt Angle, but we, you know, that was the, the show I think that really kind of like garnered some attention, you know, mm-hmm. as far as like what we were trying to do. Cause like Dave, I mean, we all have all this, this one thing in common on this show today is that we're all uber wrestling fans we've been watching it since we were kids and we wanted to uh you know we get we have a platform now to talk about our fandom so but yeah so dennis what do you got listen from one podcaster to a radio guy uh you know when was your i think i kind of made it in the industry moment because i think mine was 
being backstage riding PD's coattails and like an Eli Drake came up and was like, Hey guys, I really like the podcast. And like Eli Drake doesn't like anything. Uh, <laughs> he He's kind of a, a, a to himself guy. He doesn't come out of his shell. Very nice guy. If you get to know him, but when like an Eli Drake at that time, who I believe he was the impact champion comes up to us and is like, Hey, I listened. It's cool. I go, he knows who I am. Did, when was your holy shit? That guy knows who I am moment. It was, and I and I know I told Lars this um, um, off air. Uh, believe it or not, the one that really like kind of made me shit my pants was uh, David Lee Roth. Like, <laughs> David Lee, I, David Lee Roth was at Sir, and and I and I love David Lee Roth. I think he's the greatest front man of all time. And he was at Sirius XM, and I was telling one of uh, one of the uh, talent relations people, I was like, please, you know, you gotta introduce me to David Lee Roth and he introduced me and he's like, Hey, this is Dave LaGreca. He hosts a wrestling show on Sirius XM. And he was like, yeah, bust it open. And I was like, you got it. David Lee Roth knows who I am and knows the name of my show. Like that blew me away. And I found out later that he's like addicted to Sirius XM and that's all he listens to. And then he started telling me about, you know who he likes and and you know how he became a fan of wrestling it's like i never would have expected david lee roth of all people to not only be a wrestling fan but to like listen to busted open or know about busted open so that was like my first holy shit moment for sure well you know i remember like my first wrestling show and i'm sure that we all do but that's one thing that we never actually really have talked about ever dave and i was kind of wondering like where did the fandom begin? Like, where, what, when was it? What year? Who did you see? Who was on the card? You know, it's. Uh... Well, I mean, I, I, it took a little bit. It took a couple of years before I actually went to see it live. But in 1982, I was by my friend Jeff's house, and he was watching wrestling. I had never watched wrestling before, and he was watching. I grew up in Jersey, so this is New Jersey, and he's watching Georgia Championship Wrestling on TBS. And he goes to me, he goes, have you ever watched wrestling? Are you a wrestling fan? And I was like, no. I go, isn't that, isn't that fake? And he was like, he goes, the WWF is fake. This is the NWA and this is real. And I was like, really? He goes, yeah. He goes, the Bob Backlund, the Samoans. He goes, that's WWF. That's fake. But, but this is real. And I was like, okay. And the first person I saw on my TV was Gordon Soley interviewing Tommy Wildfire Rich. And, you know, at that time, right around that time is when Van Halen was kind of blowing up with a uh, fair warning right around that time. And my brother was a huge Van Halen fan. And I thought Tommy Rich looked like David Lee Roth. And I was like, and he was a badass. And then Buzz Sawyer, like, attacked him. And he was brawling with Buzz Sawyer. And, like, from that moment on, I, w I was hooked. Got it. Going back to your first show being hooked, uh, I was I missed out on being a tape trader, that whole community. That's kind of one of the regrets because I was like WWF, WCW, NWA. I kind of grew up on on that kind of stuff. So you get hooked. It, is it like accepted in your house? Do, do your parents start getting pay-per-views in the early 90s? You were probably 60 by then, but I mean, did you? <laughs> that is, that is, by the time pay-per-view came out, I was already like married for the third time, you know, like on my second house. Like, come on, dude. I, I mean, no, but, you know, accepted like my dad never liked wrestling. He was never a wrestling fan, but he would take me every month to the Meadowlands in Jersey um because he just wanted to you know show support and everything like that uh at school i got picked on you hear these stories i got picked on because i liked wrestling and and i literally went from one of the most popular kids in class to being one of the most unpopular kids in class and i can blame that all on pro wrestling <laughs> <laughs> but no but i I did a lot of tape trading. There was the old magazines. If you go back and watch, like, you read some of those sports review wrestling and stuff, they had pen pals in the back of the magazine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And that's how I, I kind of hooked up with other fans from other areas and started doing the tape trading. And I started doing tape trading like with fans in Japan 
and stuff like that. It's like now you just go to YouTube and you can see everything. But that back then it was such a cool community because unlike now we could get into this, like how the community of pro wrestling fans are kind of split back then. It was like, you're either in or you're out. So if you were in, didn't matter what you liked or what you watched, you were part of that community. And the enemy were all the people that didn't like wrestling or didn't understand wrestling. So it was such a magical time back in the early eighties. Well, you know, one of the things, you know, cause and I thought it might be an inter- interesting question because we're all three wrestling fans here. And, Cause one of the matches that I've seen recently was the punk MJF dog collar match. And it's, and I remember watching the Greg Valentine, Roddy Piper match. And I, and I was trying to think, when did I actually see that match? Because, you know, at the time living in California and everything, um, we weren't getting WTBS just quite yet. That didn't happen until maybe 85, okay. you know, when it actually made, when we had started getting cable, at least in my area. But I I seem to re- remember that I t- tape traded a guy with for that match. And I want to say it was kind of edited too. And it's not that long of a match. But, you know, since we're seeing kind of like, you know, this punk MJF dog collar match, and the Greg Valentine, Roddy Piper match. Do you remember, um, first of all, I want to get your thoughts on that punk MJF match. And also I want to know when you first saw the Piper, Greg Valentine match. And if you remember. I do actually. And I, I was able to watch NWA. We were, you know, on cable TV in Jersey. I was very lucky to get uh, Mid-Atlantic, Georgia, Florida, world-class, um, so I was able to get a lot of different shows in my area on cable. Um, but first I saw the clips of it on TBS because they showed the clips of that match. And then I, I, I did the same thing there. I, I went to the magazine. Somebody was selling the whole Starcade card and I bought it. Uh, and then after that, like every other Starcade was available on VHS right. like months later. And I was able to get it from Turner home video but that first starcade it was i probably i saw clips right away but it probably was about five or six months after it actually happened that i was able to watch the whole match and that match was if you go back and watch that match it's not a great match it it really isn't but it was just so different and so unique and piper like his ear bleeding and his equilibrium being off like it was so such a good story that they told in that match. But I, I, you know, you asked me about MJF and, and what we saw with punk, you know, at revolution, I, I think by far that was, you know, the best dog collar match I've ever seen. And it's one of the best matches I've seen in a very long time. I mean, the story that they told going into that match was amazing. And then the story they told in the ring that night was fantastic. And man, you, you have to be, so happy for CM Punk. And, and Lars, I know you guys have a relationship, but I got teary-eyed watching him get teary-eyed in the press conference after, after that show. Because imagine like falling out of love with something and then mm-hmm. falling back in. You could just tell he's fallen back in love with wrestling again. And, we're, and we get to witness it as fans, you know? And I think... I think all of us as fans have had those moments where it's like, it's hard to be a wrestling fan. And then there's always that moment that it kicks you right back in again. And then you realize why you're a fan and to be able to see that up close with punk. It's, it's really maybe one of the best experiences that I've been able to see in my 40 years of, of being a fan. Also, imagine being successful in a million other things outside of wrestling, being a Marvel comic writer, uh, a UFC career, and all you hear from everybody else is, why aren't you back in wrestling? Get back into wrestling. Like, that's that still has to wear down on a guy where, like, hey, there's only a handful of people that can go out and do a Marvel comic. And now everybody's shitting on me because I'm successful in something else. And, and I'm only speculating, Lars, you and I have never talked, but that's that has to like add to a little bit of the hatred of that wrestling community for a guy that's like, what more do I have to fucking do around here to, to, to make people stop? Well, I think, you know, you burn out on anything, you know what I mean? And I think that when you, 
you know, we know the story. I mean, he put his body through the ringer and at some point something's got to give, right? So it's like, it's, if you're beating your body up to the point where you're taking so many antibiotics in the ring because you have a staph infection that's undiagnosed and you're shitting your pants, there's some, there's a problem, right? Yeah. So, and I mean, honestly, I, you know, there's been moments in my career where, you know, the road has been such a grind that I'm just like, what the fuck, you know, you know, you don't really know your ass from a hole in the wall. And, and when you continue to do that and continue to do that, you're going to, your relationship with the, the, your passion is going to change inevitably. You know what I mean? And I think that watching him now, like you were touching on Dave, and it kind of leads me into my next question. Um, but, you know, you're seeing that, that, that spark and that relove and that rekindle, uh, re rekindled relationship he has for professional wrestling. It's like right now, you know, we've talked about it and I still think we are still here with the NWA, GCW, Impact Wrestling, AEW, WWE. There's so much, and New Japan. I mean. And then the countless um, Japanese wrestling territories or promotions, I'm I should say, you know, it's like, um, you know, being, you know, a radio host where you have to consume so much wrestling and, you know, and the burnout question is like, how do you consume it all without, you know, you know, without burning out from being so, you know, hyper, uh, what do you call it, stimulated from all of it? How do you separate it and how do you kind of keep bringing a new product, like how a, a new attitude? It's, it's, it's a great question because it's very, very difficult. Number one, it's hard to consume. Like you mentioned that punk MJF dog collar match. If that match happened 25, 30 years ago as a kid, I would have been watching that match again and again, you know, I, 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 a week later, two weeks later, a month, you know, and that, you can't consume wrestling like that because it, it, things move so fast. Like you could go to and watch a WrestleMania and say, man, that was a great WrestleMania. But then right after that WrestleMania is done, it's like, all right, what's going to happen on Raw tomorrow night? It's like, it's hard to even consume it. But to get back like to what you were saying about all these different promotions and, sh and shows, I'll say this, there's certain shows that it's a pleasure to watch and I watch it as a fan. And then there's certain shows that it's like, all right, I'm actually getting paid to watch this because it's do, doing the show is fun for me, but there's certain nights of the week where it's like, all right, this is where I earn my money. Cause this is a tough <laughs> watch, you know? So, and, and, and it all goes in ebbs and flows. Like, you know, some shows will be great, and then then the next week it's bad. But even when we were kids, you know, there would be one show you wait all week to watch it, and it wasn't that great. But you were just happy because you were watching wrestling. I'll, I'll admit it because I say it on Busted Open. There's some Monday nights where it's a struggle to watch Raw, or it's a struggle to go through three hours. But then you get something like we had recently on Raw with Stone Cold you know, teasing, he's coming back and it, and then your fandom kicks in, you know? Right. So, but it is very, very hard, but then sometimes, and, and Lars, you probably know this too. There's times that you will go up on stage and then you're in, just in love with being on stage and it's fun. And then there's probably some days where maybe even something simple and people don't even think about this. Maybe you have a headache, you know, maybe you got, I, I mean, and then you're going up there and you're not enjoying yourself because you don't feel good. And you're going to put on the best show you possibly can because an audience paid, but it's a struggle to get through. So it's, it's probably no different than that. By the way, I don't even know how you do that, Lars. How do you go on stage with like a migraine headache or a stomach ache or anything like that? You know, I mean, I, you know, there's been a few times where I've had to go up there with food poisoning. And I'm knocking on wood just because those were the miserable. I've had pneumonia up there. Um, you know, I put my, you know, cause you put your body through the ringer. Um, it's something that happens. It's, it's a mind over matter thing. You know what I mean? I, I was really sick one time when I was in Sweden and we had a show in Germany and it was an 18 hour drive. And the doctor basically said he cannot be on a bus because his lung might collapse, you know, because of the bounciness. And so it was, turned out that the show was kind of a shoddy, you know, it was kind of like an after it kind of like sort of got it added 
you know, after the tour had been completely booked, but they wanted to kind of fill a date because that's just kind of where we were, play anywhere, anytime kind of thing. And the doctor basically said, he cannot go. You know what I mean? He pushed on my chest just a little bit to kind of see where the pain was. And I buckled over and Tim was with me and he's like, you're not doing anything. And the, the ir irony of it is, is, well, we went, we ended up going to Copenhagen because Denmark was our next stop. So we had a couple of days off of there, but the next night that we were supposed to play the night after we were supposed to play that same venue, the top floor with the club on it had collapsed oh onto gosh. the first floor. So it's like, these little things, you know what I mean? That like, you know, that you don't think of at the time, but you're like, fuck, we would have, we were going there. You know, it could have very well been us collapsing down, you know, to the, Great. to the bottom floor. But, you know, I think, I feel like, you know, I also was in my twenties too. So it, it's, it's a little easier to get over it. Yeah. You know what I mean? You know, now that I'm, you know, 50 and I'm just like, fuck dude, I don't want to go to fucking, you know, blah, blah, blah. You know, I just don't want to do it. And if I have a choice now, I just don't. You know what I mean? So go ahead, Dennis. Sorry. That's why he's never been to Michigan. I don't know. What are you talking about? I was probably, you know what, Dennis? I was probably in Michigan before you were born. You you probably were, and you'll be here in April. So yeah, I, I can't wait for that one. Dave, back to your radio career. We've, we all have that one guest, and I'll even say mine right now, where uh, you go in, you, you get him, he's big enough name, you're excited to have him on, you don't really care one way or another for him. But after the interview, you go, you know what, I kind of like that guy. For me, it was, I'm gonna say it, don't hate me, Matt Hardy. Like, I, I, I like Matt Hardy, I respected Matt Hardy. Matt Hardy was never one of my favorites. The tag team, the Hardy Boys were never one of my all time favorites. But after talking to him, I go, wow, I, I really like this guy. And he goes and follows me. And I'm like, holy shit, now Matt Hardy follows me. Is there a guy that that just completely turned you around on what you thought after you had a chance to talk to him? Uh, that's a that's a really good question too. Um, I mean, I don't know if it's about like so much turning my opinion around, uh, but Carmelo Hayes, who wrestles with NXT, I didn't really know a lot about him uh, before interviewing him. And then I interviewed him and I absolutely fell in love with him. So now, like, I'm completely a fan. Um, and there's been wrestlers the other way. I haven't had a lot of bad interviews, but one would have been, and, and rest in peace to King Kong Bundy. But that guy was a tough interview. Like, he was just angry at the world when we talked to him and he just wasn't having it. Um, and, you know, I was always a fan of King Kong Bundy, so it kind of broke my heart when we had him on and he was so just like, it, it, you could tell he wanted to do anything else that day, but talk to me. Uh, <laughs> another one was Ole Anderson, Ole Anderson. Okay. And I grew up watching Georgia championship wrestling. So I worshiped Ole Anderson. We had him on for over 30 minutes and it's archived somewhere. I got to find it, but he just shit all over me for 30 minutes. Like, He's like, what wrestlers do you think are, 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 are some of the all-time greats? I was like, you know, Ric Flair, Ricky Steamboat, the road. He, uh, Flair's the shits. Steamboat's the shits. Road Warriors were green, you know, uh, drizzling shits. Like, and then he's like, what do you know? And what do you know about wrestling? You don't know what you're talking about. He just for like 30 minutes just ripped me apart for 30 minutes. Like, I'm I just relentless. Um, and that was one of my first interviews on Busted Open. Wow. So I think it calloused my, 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 my mind and my body enough to be able to do this for the long haul. But I, I don't know if I'm the biggest Ole Anderson fan after, after that 30 minutes with him. Lars, do you have one, one way or another? I don't, I don't know if you do. I know that's putting you on the spot, but you knew it was coming. Yeah, I kind of knew and I started thinking about it, but then I got lost in what Dave was saying because you know how much I love King Kong Bundy. Would it be um, like a Matt Cordona? When, when, were you there for that interview? Uh, no, I wasn't a Matt. A Matt well, definitely like, love Matt Cordona and what he's done. I mean, honestly, I think, you know, from what he's done outside of the WWE, I think has been way more impactful. It's so funny because it's like you when you see these guys actually get like the, the chains are broken off of them. I'm sure you know about this, Dave, too. Yeah. It's like. And you see these guys uber succeed, do something that makes you fall in love with wrestling again. 
from the guy least likely, in your opinion, to ever make that impact. Matt Cardona, I'm sorry, I mean, I'm just not burying the guy or talking shit about him, but he was the most, it's like that yearbook, most likely to succeed, most likely not to succeed. Matt Cardona, in my opinion, just because of the way WWE treated him, you would never, ever see that. And I actually went up to him at the TNA or the, excuse me, the Impact, um, uh, one of the pay-per-views. And I said, listen, you did the greatest thing ever in wrestling, in my opinion. Guys, you know, can, I, can I ask, hold on. Please. Can I just quick, I just got to quickly use the bathroom. Is that cool? Yes. It's all right. right. <laughs> <laughs> that's a first for us. That's a, that's a little Greca bathroom break. I mean, how do you not? I mean. Yeah, I mean, let's talk about that a little bit because <laughs> we're not going to because here's the thing, Dennis, we're not going to edit this out. Not at all. <laughs> this I mean, has got to stay in. And, you know, fucking he's healing us right now. That's, Definitely healing us. He's like, you know, I could have gone beforehand, but uh, <laughs> I was using my urine as a gauge on whether I want to leave this interview early or not. It's the urine gauge. It's the urine you know gauge. I mean? it's, <laughs> a, it's a LaGreca urine gauge. <laughs> oh, dude, I'm making T-shirts with that on it. La Greca, I'm coming after you. You know what we're gonna do? Instead of La Greca heads, you know what I mean? You know what I'm saying? Yeah. We can. I am, put, like, we can... I, I am so sorry. Look, La, La Greca colostomy bags. Exactly. I... No more. No more La Greca heads. It's it's the La Greca urine break. We're not no, cutting that out, Dave. You got you, you got to understand. Number one, like you were just talking about being on stage. And like with food poisoning and stuff like right at that moment, like, I don't know, my stomach just went, Arr. and I was like, <laughs> and then you're talking about Zack Ryder. I'm like, oh my God, like, am I going to make it? For another 30 minutes? <laughs> so I apologize for no, that. No, no, I'm, used to, I'm used to radio. We take breaks every 15 minutes. So no, I always, for sure. So you, apparently you do here now. <laughs> I, uh, <laughs> Are you going to be able to edit that out? Or are you keeping that We're in? We're keeping it in. We're keeping that in. Oh, We're my God. That, <laughs> that may be the, one of the most embarrassing moments of my life. I love it. Thank you. You're, you're welcome. It you could know, have been much worse, though, if I didn't run right there. Right it, would have been, it would have been much more embarrassing if I didn't run to the bathroom right there. All right. Let, let's reset this and start with this question for you. It really it had nothing to do with Zack Ryder. I think so it I had everything. Want, I don't want you to think it's no, Zach Ryder I think, I think, that made think, me that upset. Though it could be. It yeah. could have yeah. been. It I could mean, have we're gonna have to tweet him to the audience. We'll tweet him and let him decide. Yeah. So <laughs> so let me reset this now and, and bring this back where you have become part of pop culture in wrestling. The the heads everywhere, and you're you're not a guy that quite asks for it. I know you enjoy it. We all would. If I, I mean, I've seen, you know, people hold up podcast signs here and there and impact shows. And I'm like, Oh, but to have your head as a guy that was like a fan, you, you didn't start putting the ring together. You were not a ring guy. You're just a fan who have now, I, I hate to use it like this, but inserted himself in the wrestling culture. I mean, I mean, let's talk about the first time you've seen that on TV for you. Can you take us back to that moment where you go, is that my, that's my head. The first, the first time I saw my head, uh, I was actually in the building. Uh, it was the new Japan ring of honor show at the garden. I, I, I'm, I looked to the right and, and, you know, and I didn't have great seats. <laughs> this person had much better seats than me had my head. And I was like, that, no. And it's so funny because, like, Ian Riccoboni actually tweeted out because people thought it was his head, Ian's head. And I was like, I, I don't think that, I think that's my head. And, then I, and I actually went down and I was like, oh, my God, it, somebody had my head up. And I still have the picture. I had to angle the picture because it's Madison Square Garden. So I had to get the person holding up my head and get the ceiling of Madison Square Garden. That was like so surreal seeing that. And then like after that, people started like doing like so all over. And even there was the WWE was in the UK and somebody had my head up. And I was like, I mean, it's it still happens from time to time. Somebody had it at Revolution, at AEW's Revolution, but I can't tell you how surreal 
That is, and uh, it it still amazes me uh, that that that's that that somebody would actually go and 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 do that and, and blow up my head and and bring that to an arena. It's crazy to me. Well, I mean, and to follow up on that on that last question, you know, now then you get into like a pseudo program with Thunder Rosa. Right? Oh, I wanted to talk about that too. You know, and I wanted to kind of segue into that because I mean, here you are this uber wrestling fan, then you become basically uh, the host of the biggest wrestling talk show, radio show, podcast, whatever it is. And then now you're stepping foot into the ring. You're, you know, cutting promos on each other. I mean, now, did you ever envision this for yourself? No. Or and, and I was kind of a little honest, Lars, like a little afraid because I'm not an athletic person at all. So I was like, I'm stepping into the ring. This is, the, the, I should have no business being in the ring. But Thunder Rosa, and I've been a fan of hers uh, early on before she even got the opportunity with the NWA. And so I put her, she's been on our show even dating back before going to NWA. So she remembers that. And she's such a loyal, great person. Um, but yeah, going to Buda, Texas, it was in May. Um, and traveling out there, and I really didn't know what was going to happen. And I'm going to be honest with you guys. You can go back and watch it. It's on YouTube. She beat my ass. Like, she really <laughs> did beat the hell out of me. And she was like, if you go back and look, she drop kicks me, and the whole the whole ring moved. Like, the, I was like, I, I completely – knocked the wind right out of me and the, those chops and I got pictures like you could see her handprint and blood you know on my chest because uh, because the chops that she gave me I was I was hurting my ribs were bruised my stomach was bruised she really beat the hell out of me but I, it, it was it was definitely surreal and it's so funny like I was afraid like oh my god am I gonna like am I gonna like shit my pants and it took doing this show for me to almost shit my <laughs> <laughs> we did something thunder rosa couldn't do i guess that's right and that's right um oh, maybe it's I a mean, there's coffee a, i'm drinking i don't there's know a, there's there's a there's a busted open pun here somewhere I, I, I'll, I'll leave, listen i'll leave that guys for you i think i'm gonna get killed on it and rightfully <laughs> so that was pretty embarrassing but uh, but even like Thunder Rosa was wrestling Deanna Perrazzo uh, on Impact. And I'm watching it. And there was like a Dave LaGreca chant. Doing, I'm like, what is going on here? And, I ne you know, it's, it's, just, it's just amazing. And we have the best fan base. I really, uh, the Busted Open Nation's fantastic. And I always say this when I used to teach broadcasting. And, and this is an example of it. You never know who's listening. You really don't. And like, you know, Lars is listening and, you know, Nita Strauss is listening. And like, you know, that's amazing to me that like that people that I admire from a completely different world, you know, tune in and listen to the show. So, you know, you, you really don't know the audience and how much of an impact that you're making on people who are listening to your voice. Well, I, I, just, just real quick, I want to say that I met Thunder Rosa back in Chicago and what a beautiful, nice person. So yes. that's all I could. And I and I, I was I was I've always liked her. I think she's the best. Her and Britt Baker are the top two. I mean, and I think there's a few others that I'm just. But I'm gonna just say, watching Britt Baker and Thunder Rosa wrestle, it's it's another level. So I, I digress. No, and, and it also shows Lars, and you probably know this from the music world. You don't have to be an asshole. Right. No. You could be the best and you could have all these legions of fans and like a Britt Baker, you know, 20,000 fans are chanting DMD, but she's one of the nicest people I've nicest ever met. People. Like it shows you that you could be successful and you could, you could, you could win without having to stab people in the back or being no. a bad person or talking shit. Like you could succeed and still be a good be a good person for sure Amen. 
But the, the kind of piggyback off all this, you and Thunder Rosa kind of have this like sweet interaction together where I, I the pictures, the the interviews, it 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 makes me feel like you two are like genuine best friends. Can you talk a little bit about are you coming back or are you leaving now? Did I <laughs> I just I, I got props. Oh, okay. Oh, oh. there is uh me and Thunder, you know, we sat at the uh, Houston Zoo. And got a, a character of us made, and it says "best friends." And <laughs> you know, she really is a great, a great friend. I mean, she, you know, and, be, and she's become friends with my wife Violetta. And my my wife Violetta is not a wrestling fan by any means. Um, we no, there is, there is. I I think there is, lo- you know, like love and respect and everything you know, between us because she's just genuinely a great person. How, how did it happen? That's kind of where I wanted to go with this question was, look, uh, Lars and I, he came on the podcast. I slipped into his DMs. Will you be a guest? He comes on afterwards. He says, here's my number. Call me. And then we slowly became friends with, he wanted to be part of the podcast. And then I, I never knew him before he was a guest on. And now, you know, we text each other and we talk and you know what, like sometimes we butt heads, but we work it out. And, and it shows that, you know, we're growing as, a, I don't want to use the word couple, but Lars, I'm down on one knee right now. And uh, well, I, some- I accept, I accept. Yes. I know what kind of, I know what kind of job security you have. So we're doing it. I have insurance, baby. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Woo! I got but, kids. <laughs> but kind of like that, where Thunder comes on as a guest, how do you grow that relationship? I think it's just like any other relationship, right? It's built on, uh, admiration and respect and you know a, a, a common theme between you two whether it's you know music or wrestling or movies or something you know having something in common but I you know and I've felt this since day one it's just I'm gonna be me I'm gonna be who I am I'm not gonna BS uh, and you like me love me or hate me one thing that I've I've learned over time is not everyone's gonna like you yeah, you know, there are going to be people for whatever reason that aren't going to like you. Uh, but as long as you're yourself and, 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 I, and I think, you know, whether you're a celebrity or not, and I'm, I'm sure there's some celebrities that, you know, think their shit doesn't stink, but I don't think most people are like that. I think most people, you know, want to have friendships and want to build relationships with people. So I think that's, I think that's important. And it's just happened over time. And I think I've done that too you know, Tommy and, and Mark Henry, like those are guys that are, you know, the top of their game, but just genuinely just like great people, good people to be around uh, and fair and honest. And and, that, and that's all you can ask. And that's what happened with Thunder. I think she's just a, a really genuinely good person. And, you know, Lars too. I, I call Lars and I'm always thinking, oh God, I hope I'm not, I hope I'm not like, you know, bothering him, or I hope this is a good time. I, you know, I know he's a busy guy. Now I can pick up the phone, be like, fuck it. If he doesn't want to pick it, if he doesn't want to answer the phone, he just won't answer the phone, you know? Wait, wait, how often does he not answer the phone for you? Because <laughs> I, I, gotta... I, I'm not on that, I'm not on that relation. Like, we've only spoken like a few times. Okay. But, but, <laughs> but, I can, but I can say this about Lars. I could tell like, he's just a great, genuinely, good person without a doubt with without a doubt so i you feel like a kinship with people like that you know you trying well, to you, steal my host <laughs> i'll cut you who knows you, never, hey, you know. never know i mean i could take steps you know but anyway th- okay so you're watching wrestling this is one of the things that i don't know if you have the same kind of thing that you know sometimes i take notes so are you taking notes to have talking points for the next day's show, um, you know, how are you sort of gathering your information? I know we, you know, you said, okay, some shows I feel like I'm earning my money. Some shows I watch as a fan, but how are you retaining it? Is how uh, what I what I'm what I'm meaning to I've ask you. I've gone through like a million notebooks. Like I, I'm always writing stuff down. When I watch the shows, I have a, a pen and notebook with me, and because you never know what's going to be a good talking point. So I kind of bullet point all these things that I think would be interesting to talk about the next day. And some of it I'll use, some of it I won't. But yeah, I I think it just, and it also helps me remember too, because when you watch so much wrestling, things kind of go right through. 
the excuse, you know, used uh, what just happened to me a little bit goes right through you. But, uh, but you know, it's, it's always good to help. It helps you remember when you write things down, you know? So I've, I'm always constantly, yeah, I use, I've gone through a million of these notebooks, just writing things down as I'm watching them for sure. You, you start with the show. You have now a weekend show with people popping in and out. You've kind of, I, I noticed you don't do a lot of the weekend stuff. Do, do you have plans to like build the La Greca empire into like a podcasting network? That seems like the, the kind of the cool thing to do now, if you have it, what, what are your, how do you grow it? I mean, you don't seem like a guy that's just happy having the number one show. You strike me as a guy that gets to the top and goes, all right, now I want to uh, branch it out and start conquering other things. I'm only asking for a job. <laughs> you never know, like, you know, what's the future at Sirius XM? You know, when my contract's up, they might say, you know what, we're, we're good. We've, it was a good run. So you always got to keep options open. You got you know, you to make sure that you have your hand in a couple of different things. Uh, right now, I love working with Sirius XM. It, uh, it's a dream. I don't want to leave Sirius XM. But you're, to your point, I am doing other things. Like there is the deal with Pod Swag. Um, I, I'm on pro wrestling tees. Uh, Mark and I do uh, a traveling show uh, called Nation Across the Nation, where you know once a month we travel to a different pay per view and 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 hang out with fans. And you know that's something that's been very very successful. Um, I'm hoping to get a show with my brother back up and running again. Uh, it's a La Greca show that we were doing on YouTube, and then he just got very very busy with you know, sports and hockey, which is what he deals with. Um, and he wasn't able to do the show, but I'm always open to doing different things and doing more things. And it's fun. You know, I, it's, it's not work when you enjoy what you're doing, but, but yeah, I, I kind of like doing more than just one thing and keeping my options open. Well, we're, you know, <clears throat> you're, you watch, we all watch a bunch of wrestling. We have to, you know I mean? It's our passion. It's what we, what we enjoy. Who, in your opinion, right now, uh, there's three, three, three parts to this. Who's the best babyface right now in all companies? Who's the best heel right now, in your opinion, in all companies? And who is the undisco undiscovered talent that you think this guy just needs a shot and he'll rise to the top? Great question. I, I think right now in wrestling and the biggest babyface to me might be CM Punk, uh, you know, because... He's dealing with, in my opinion, the biggest heel in pro wrestling, MJF. That, that used to go hand in hand back in the day, right? Hulk Hogan was the biggest baby face. So the biggest heel was whoever Hogan was in a feud with at that time. Uh, CM Punk, Dennis, as you were saying, gone for seven years. Comes back. He's the returning hero. Um, and everybody wants to see what he's going to do next. MJF is just a piece of garbage. Uh, hard, you know, look what he did in this story. He turned everybody. He got everybody to feel sympathy for him. And then mm -hmm. like he did to CM Punk, he just kicked them right in the nuts. Um, so yeah, to me, that's the biggest, the biggest heel and the biggest baby face for sure, without a doubt, Punk and MJF. And as far as like untapped talent, uh, somebody that I just feel hasn't gotten the right home is, is Kiara Hogan. Uh, she did mm. a wonderful job tagging with Tasha Steeles. And it's been great since that team has broken up to see Tasha Steeles go on and win gold with Impact, now the Impact Knockouts champion. Um, I want to see that for Kiara Hogan. I think she's very talented. I think she has charisma and personality. I just don't think she's found the right home yet. When she does, I think she's going to be a major superstar. You, you know, to jump in on the untapped talent one, uh, it changed for me Sunday because, look, we all know Swerve and we were a fan of his NXT. But when he came out at Revolution, it, it changed the, the feeling in that arena. He walked out and I saw that guy as a bona fide champion star. And boy, right there. And I don't know if you can call, you know, one of the top NXT talents untapped. But boy, when he came out. 
I thought, and I knew who he was. I wasn't um, a fan or not like him. He was just kind of neutral on my radar. But after that moment, I, I thought, I, I want to be that guy's biggest fan because he just he he totally came out and said, I'm a star. Look at me. I um, I was lucky enough that morning, uh, uh, Sunday morning, the, the, the day of the pay-per-view, I taped a podcast where, with him, his Swerve City podcast. He had, me on, he had me on as a guest. And I mean, you talk about a guy who's talented. Uh, Shane Strickland is talented. Shane Strickland's talented in the ring, on the microphone, music, producing, video editing, like around the around the horn. He may be one of the most talented people I've ever met. And um, in the ring, here's a guy before he got the opportunity to work with the WWE, he made his name by wrestling any kind of match you threw his way. He'd, he'd, he'd wrestle a scientific technical match and then he would do a death match. Like that guy just wanted to show that he was versatile enough to be able to do anything. And I can't believe that he was let go by the WWE. I, he's one of those names. Like, I just can't believe it. Like, you know, it's like a Bray Wyatt. Like, how does Bray Wyatt get let go by the WWE? Like, it's, it's, it's insane to me. And I think with the WWE, this is not a negative. It's, it's, it just is what it is it's a machine. Like, I think when you're a wrestler with the WWE, you're just spoke in the wheel and you know, you could leave and it, that, that, that wheel is going to keep turning. That machine's right. going to keep going. Um, I think there's so many different companies now. And I think with AEW, I think that's going to be a good fit for Shane. I really do. What about you, Lars? Who do you think's the breakout? When I saw Swerve come on there, you know, I've seen Swerve a, a bunch of times on the indies and it's always like you know when he walks in that ring everything gets elevated you know what i mean he's just that yeah. he's like one of those guys he's like a charlotte flair or uh an mjf or you know you know he's like just one of those guys who just oozes that charisma oozes that talent and just raises the bar and he doesn't have to do anything except for just come there like you said i felt the same thing as you were, then it's because seeing him on the indies and seeing how, you know, guys, right. He's like the guy that, that, that helps you rise up. You know what I mean? He's got that much talent, you know what I mean? And so I would say him, um, but, you know, I wanted to ask you guys a question, like, you know, we all watch obviously a sh shit ton of, of, of professional wrestling. Who's the one guy in your opinion that you might know, Right. And you think the world might know not know about. And that's a question for both of you guys. Is there a guy out there that you kind of like, because I got my guy and I'm going to give it right now. His name's Hoodfoot. Right. And this I love this guy and, and watching him wrestle his heart, his charisma, his talent and how he can tell the story, even though it might be in a genre where it's not very known for telling stories. But I think a good death match, you have to tell a story and a good story. But like that's the guy that like I'm cluing in on watching, and now is every move. So, do you guys got guys like that, Dave? I'm trying to think now because well, it's. I'll, I'll let you think, and while you think, I'll jump in and say okay, mine. Go ahead, please. And, and mine is uh, is indie known, but not mainstream known. It's it's Effie. Uh, when they came out and did that, uh, what was it that last big show uh, in Philly? I, I, I immediately went and listened to Elton John song like four or five different times. I, I mean, there, he, he, that the way that crowd was waving and, and he's embraced his sexuality, his in ring work is great. I, I feel like if this guy was on the main stage, he would be a bona fide, he, he'd easily be like a, a, a Sami Zayn kind of big where we all know Sami Zayn. Sami Zayn's not going to be a world champion, but you know what? Sami Zayn is very secure. Zayn, Sami Zayn's not going anywhere and he's entertaining. And that's where I see Effie if he was on the main stage somewhere. Uh, Effie's a great one because you know, we've had him on the show and I think he has all the tools to be a major superstar. And as you were talking about Effie, it reminded me of somebody else that 
I, you know, I, I think people know him, but like to go to Lars' point, not enough people know him, and that's Dalton Castle. Mm-hmm. Like Dalton Castle, yeah, even in Ring of Honor, like he had championship opportunities, but never had that big opportunity. Like even that show that I was talking about earlier at Madison Square Garden with New Japan and Ring of Honor, his match that he had was like 30 seconds long. Like I just feel like. God, he's so charismatic and has such a great personality. And his entrance is almost like custom made for like a big extravagant entrance. But yet he's never really had that opportunity. And honestly, right now, I don't even think he has a job. Like he was just recently let go from Ring of Honor. Ring of Honor kind of let all the contracts expire. Like, I don't even know if he's gotten picked up by anybody. But if I'm AEW, WWE, NWA, I, I I I put my stock into in, into Dalton Castle. Yeah, he's one of those guys that I. It, he's just, a good even wrestler a, too. Yeah, and he, it's not just about his mic work and his personality. He's good in the ring as well. Yeah, and, and he's a nice guy. He is a genuinely nice guy. We had him on the podcast. He was funny. Uh, I I'd have him on in a heartbeat again, but. Lars doesn't like him. No, I'm joking there. Uh, we got time. for. I love him. Are you kidding me? I love him. (laughs) I'll say this. My wife, Violetta, who's not um, a wrestling fan at all, loves Dalton Castle. I actually have a picture back here of them together. And at the 10 year anniversary party, which is going to be this in April, three years since our 10 year anniversary party in New York, my wife let uh, Dalton Castle taste her pierogi. And I don't Ooh. just let any man taste my wife's pierogi. <laughs> and Walton Castle tasted it, and he loved it. And, um, you know, that tells you how big of a fan I am of his, that I even let him taste Violetta's don't do it, Lars. Don't do it, Lars. Do not do it. Don't do it. I, I, I'm, I'm going to just leave it. Thank I'm you. Leave it. Thank it's you. Well, look, we got time for wet. It's a little wet. It's, you know, you got to make sure you... <laughs> but Lars. Let, me, let me just... Is it, what, oh. what is it? I just want to know what it's filled with, you know. There it is. Oh, you know what? You're gonna have to. You're gonna have to taste it for yourself. Is it, is it on the sweeter side, or is it like? I mean, are we? Do we have to put a little jelly around it or on it? I mean, <laughs> I honestly don't think you need to add anything to it, Lars. It's fine the way that it is. Now, do I get Lars's sloppy seconds <laughs> off his pierogi, or do I get my own pierogi, or do I have to watch Lars eat the pierogi? Do I? Am I even invited okay. to the pierogi okay, party? Okay, stop, 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 stop. Time out. Let's get to our last question because this will be the rest of the show. And I really want to ask this question. Okay. Lars, we can so, go long here because I already used the bathroom. So that I don't have enough. to worry about you can go as long as you want. We have 15 well, more minutes. <laughs> no. Okay. So well, here's the thing. Big news. You know, Tony Khan buys Ring of Honor. Okay. So first the, my first thought was like, great, now that we're gonna have actually a wrestling fan who's going to archive this footage, you know, there's, you know, anybody who's anybody in the wrestling world went through Ring of Honor, okay? Let's just be honest, right? It's almost like, it's kind of like when you're a thrash metal guy, like, you know, you had to join Exodus to be successful. You had to join Exodus and then, and then leave them and then you became successful or whatever, right? So, and I'm, you know, obviously using that as a very loose kind of, uh, uh, um, um, what'd you call it? Whatever. Thank you. So, my second thought was, well, he's got enough already to handle. What the hell is he going to do? I mean, is he biting off more than he can chew? Is he spreading himself too thin? You know, like, what are your predictions? What do you think he's doing this for? How do you, do you think he's going to rebrand it? And, you know, what are we, what are we, what are, what are we going to speculate here? I think with Tony Khan and first, like, I admire Tony Khan. And a lot of a lot of fans that listen to the show say I'm a kiss ass. I'm on AEW payroll, which is completely obviously not true. I'm just a big fan. Well, I just AEW. will say for the record, I'm on AEW's payroll. So thank you, Tony Khan, and thank you, Ruby Soho. I digress. They, yes, but you know, there's reasons why, and you're ultra talented, and the music is second to none. But for me you know, it's just not true. I just admire AEW and I admire Tony Khan. And I think the reason why I admire Tony Khan, and this will get to the, to answer your question is that he's just like us. He's a fan. Like there's been times Tony Khan has been on the show and then the show ends and we wind up talking for another hour off air, 
just bullshitting about wrestling. Like he is a fan first and foremost. And I think in his own way, he's kind of building his own empire, very similar to what Vince McMahon did back in 1983, 84. Now he did it in a different way. It kind of completely got away from what pro wrestling was in its roots and went more into the entertainment side of things. I think Tony Khan really respects and understands the history of pro wrestling and ring of honor. Cause Lars, like you said, Seth Rollins, Kevin Owens, Sami Zayn, Brian Danielson, CM Punk. The list goes on and on of people that have gone through those doors. And I think that that library means a lot to him. And I think that's a big thing. And I think that's also why CM Punk got emotional on Sunday yeah. night was because now he knows that Ring of Honor is in good hands mm -hmm. with Tony Khan and those matches that he had and his history is not going to be lost. It's actually in really good hands. But I also think that AEW has a very big roster, yeah, such yeah. a big roster that they can't get all their wrestlers on TV. So I think Ring of Honor is going to be used in that kind of a way where it's going to be another show, another brand, and he can use the talent that he already has and maybe some newer talent to be a part of that show. I pray that it doesn't become a YouTube channel kind of like NWA yeah. does because NWA deserves to be on TV somewhere. It doesn't, it, it, and I'm sure it, they're happy and they probably carved out a nice little niche on YouTube, but NWA ring of honor deserves to be on TV. Not, not a uh, AEW dark. It, it needs to have its own time slot somewhere for it to be successful. I, I understand where you're coming from, and I, I understand how important TV is, and there's no doubt about it. But I will say this, too. We had Carrie Silken on Busted Open, and Carrie was an ambassador, owner of Ring of Honor, been a part of that company for years. And he actually said on our air that, you know, Ring of Honor is in a much better place now than it was just a week ago because Tony Khan. And he even said, Carrie said, even if it's on YouTube, even if Ring of Honor is on YouTube, it's in a better place than when they were with Sinclair. You know, Sinclair Broadcasting, just, it would be on one o'clock in the morning, three o'clock in the morning. It'd be preempted for soccer games and yeah. hockey games. I, I, you couldn't follow it. You couldn't find it. Uh, even if it's on YouTube, and I agree with you, Dennis, that I hope it finds a home on TV, but even if it's on YouTube, to know that, all right, at seven o'clock on a Wednesday, I can watch Ring of Honor. That, that, I'm fine with that. And Dennis, those, those AEW dark shows, Elevation, they do some big numbers on YouTube. No, I, I get it. I just find it hard. I, and I think we've talked about this before on, on other podcasts where we as wrestling fans, we're programmed that USA, TNT, those are the two channels. If it's outside of that, those peripherals, you have to start hunting for it, and then it becomes uh, – right. even though you just type it into the computer, it feels like you have to work so much harder to get to that content than it is going 8 o'clock Monday night, raw, click. I, and, but and you know we're, what? We're, we're brainwashed for that. I, I agree to that to, to a certain extent, but I think that the modern wrestling fan, it's like you know when, when I'm trying to watch the re, a replay of, of – um, uh, uh, revolution right um you know my my son who's a wrestling fan says why don't we just look it up on youtube so i think people are like now know that they have to go to these avenues because youtube now has a youtube tv of course you have the fight tv that which we're on yep. you know what i mean hello everyone at fight and um you know you have different apps that support different things like i don't even have cable tv anymore Everything that I do now is through my Apple TV. So if I watch AEW, it's through Hulu. And if I watch WWE, it's through Peacock, you know, and I even can watch, you know, um, uh, you know, whatever it is, I can find it through an app or whatever it is. And I feel like that's the, that's the future of programming, right? So it's, it's through, and you know, when I watch Impact, it's through the Impact app, you know what I mean? So I'm sort of used to that and having to go through those those situations or go through those channels to watch to to watch wrestling. Um, I guess for me, it's like, you know, what you know, my my another thing that you guys have brought up 
what you're talking about, AEW Dark. Does AEW Dark become the Ring of Honor show? I mean, you know, is, you know, or do they take that away? I mean, how, how, you know, these are all speculative ideas. I'm just thinking, how to do, is it a whole completely separate thing? Like, if you guys have this at your disposal, what do you do, Dave? Yeah, I mean, at first, to go back to your point about like the apps and, you know, we're, you know, Lars, we're 50. So for, for, for kids that are, you know, 15, 16, 17, this is like second nature right. to just go to those. And like you mentioned, Dennis Fight, like I love Fight TV. You know, Fight TV, that's how I watch my Impact pay-per-views. That's how I watch GCW. I, watch, I mean, I'm on Fight uh, without a doubt three, four times a week yeah. watching pro wrestling. And on Fight TV is where I was watching Ring of Honor because I couldn't find it anywhere. I was right. watching the replays of the shows on Fight. Um, if, if, if I had ring of honor, I wouldn't make it a developmental show. I would make it, I would keep dark and elevation for that. I would make ring of honor, a completely different show, a completely different brand. I would make ring of honor what it one once was, you know, like the top indie show. I would keep it, you know, that indie roots to it, but maybe, you know, put it more on a national scale because you have the money. Um, you know, I would I would kind of make uh, Ring of Honor what NXT Triple H's version of NXT that black and gold brand like because this NXT 2.0 gives me a freaking migraine. But like that black and gold brand where it was a third brand for the WWE, I would make Ring of Honor like an, I would have you know I would have Dynamite, I would have Rampage, and I would have Ring of Honor. That's what I would do if if it's up to me my first call is to ed norholm being like hey listen you you've got impact there you've got uh, new japan on, on your network let's put ring of honor there put it on a totally different network like you like dave said make it its own entity and you can play with it so much more you can bring people up and down you invasion if you wanted to i mean yeah. we're talking way down the line but it needs to be i don't want to say hidden away but i think i think a a what is it uh what's the channel that uh, their impacts on now uh is it access access, access. access. Yeah. i think access and ring of honor would fit like a glove i agree and you can yeah, like you can have that yeah impact ring of honor new japan maybe have like a triple bill on thursdays maybe and make thursday night like a must watch you got to be tuned into access and like that I, I i don't get access on my cable system so I have to watch Impact. I watch it on YouTube. You know, I subscribe to their YouTube. It's five bucks a month or six bucks a month. And I watch it on YouTube, which is fine for me. And like Lars said, they have the Impact Plus app that you can watch it as well. But that's not a bad idea. And, you know, Impact does monster ratings for Access. I think it's their most watched show yeah. on Access. Yeah. All right. My last question. Uh, you're, you're a broadcast professional. You mentioned earlier that you taught broadcast at some point or you're a teacher. Why don't you grade yeah, us? I, I used to teach at uh, the Connecticut School of Broadcasting. I taught there for seven years. As a matter of fact, uh, Marissa Reeves, who's the head of our channel, Fight Nation, once was one of my students and now she's my boss. So That's well, crazy. Yeah. Why don't you grade us? We're two guys that just uh, sit here talking to people. What do you think? Uh, we, we, I think, Lars, you and I, we should be open to some criticism here. I agree. I don't have a lot of criticisms. Um, I, I think you both have really good chemistry together. Um, don't be afraid to jump in when you have something. Dennis, you're, you're a little bit too professional. Mm -hmm. You don't want to jump on anybody, but it is uh, – a three-way pro wrestling talk show. It's okay to jump in there with your opinion from time to time. You don't have to be so patient and so gracious. You could jump in there a little bit more. All right, Lars. Good night. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta go I take did, a. Break. Did, you know what? And I've been I've been listening to your show. Like it's okay to disagree. Like I think that kind of adds a little bit of a, a strong dynamic between you two when you disagree. Don't have to disagree all the time, but it's okay to disagree. Like yeah. I understand, Dennis. Lars is a big fucking star, man. All right, and I understand that. And and, and you're and at times you're a little intimidated by Lars. You that's gotta that's fine 
when you guys are not on the air, when you're on the air, you got to be able to, you got to be able to do that. You got, you know, you're, that is your star too, man. Look at this is a very successful podcast that you have. Lars, do you have my picture on your wall somewhere? Uh, it's in my toilet. I'll take it. That's a win for me, guys. That I don't care where it is. It's what? we call it the LaGreca room here. <laughs> so listen, well, Dennis, you should be having t-shirts of yourself. You should be putting those shirts out there for the show. Come on, man. You're you're right. You're right. Listen, I thank you for the criticism. I like it. Now I'm basically gonna David. I, I, that's not criticism. That's just you know a little pep talk. That's I, don't, I don't mean criticism as in like you're criticized. I it's you're, oh, so you're what do you mean criticism us. for? If criticism is criticizing. You just used the word criticism to describe what I was doing, Dennis. Own it. Own Back it down, Bully Ray. Use. Back it down, Bully Ray. <laughs> Jesus. Oh, my gosh. You know what, Dennis? I mean, it's it's something that's unanimous with all of us. And we're just basically, and Dave obviously sees it too. He's just saying, grow a fucking pair, bro. It's an intervention apparently now. Thanks, guys. You tricked me into a podcast to intervene. <laughs> no, no, seriously, you guys have really good chemistry. Um Thank you streamline the show, which is amazing to be able to do that betting on yourselves, which I think is absolutely fantastic. And Dennis, you have, you are much better broadcaster than I am for sure. Like you have great pipes, you have great delivery, you have great questions. You're very good at what you do, Dennis. I mean, Dennis, he's right. And I tell you this all the time. And normally Dave, I let, you know, this is, was the anomaly, but I always say you ask the first question. Because you set the tone of this whole freaking show. Because and and I and I'm with you on that one, Dave. I agree wholeheartedly. Dennis is I think great. You do a great job. And Lars, I think it's awesome because you are so successful on one side of a business to do this and you know and not kind of lean on like the things that you do outside of this show. I think is is courageous. I think it's amazing. I think you're a fantastic interviewer as well. You have great presence. And I and you know what you're easy to talk to, you're you're very easy to talk to. So that's Much it. Respect. I mean that, that's that's my critique of the show. Love it. Awesome, love it. Let's end the show right there, D. I mean we can't get any higher off that than the Greca praise. So wow. All right, bust it open. Where can people find you? Everything you guys are doing. Well, we're live on SiriusXM Monday through Saturday from 9 a.m. to noon Eastern time on channel uh, 156, Sirius XM Fight Nation. Also, you can subscribe to the Busted Open podcast. Uh, you get a, a, a modified version of the daily show on the podcast, but you also get an added Sunday show. So we're on, actually on seven days a week with the master's class. And that's with myself, Bully Ray, Tommy Dreamer, and Mark Henry each and every wow. Sunday. Uh, you can go to podswag.com for all Busted Open merchandise. Uh, you can go to Pro Wrestling Tees for exclusive Dave LaGreca merchandise. And you can follow nationacrossthenation.com uh, where Mark and I are going to be next for our traveling show that we do each and every month. Don't forget your cameo. Oh, yeah. How can I forget cameo? Go to cameo.com. Dave LaGreca for, and I'll do anything you want, man. Minute. Anything? Give me a minute. I'll give you the world. All right. Anything. Uh, and it's, only, we, it's only 25 bucks. That's all I charge for kids. $25. That's like nothing. Floyd Mayweather's like $5,000. I charge $25. Lars, you want to go half in and make him do something ridiculous? He already did. He came on the show. He did that for free. <laughs> well, well, God, well, I mean, seriously, Dennis, I actually, 30 minutes into your show, Lars had a great Zack Ryder story he was telling, and I had to jump off Mike to go use the bathroom. Like, you are going to be able to hold that over my head forever, <laughs> forever. Yeah, all you have to do, like Dennis, like, I can't even believe, like, I'm taking advice from you. You went and took a shit during the show. Like, how unprofessional is that? Oh, you can hold that over my head, Dennis. <laughs> For the, for till the end of time. Do you realize he just put me way up here with all the compliments? And he's like, you know, I took a crap during your podcast, <laughs> and now you, the compliments are worth this. Well, no. he's a fucking heel. I mean, he's always been the heel. I mean, come on, Dennis. We know we knew what we bought when we asked him on. 
You, you know, I, I am not a heel. At, at some am. point, at some point, the heel turn's going to come. You know, Lars, I mean? do you think we even look alike? Because I think I we kind of look alike. If I shaved and I started going a little more gray, I kind of feel like I'm well, looking into my start, Well, I feel like you need to, to start hitting the gym a little bit too. A lot bit. What are you talking about? <laughs> Dude, I, I just came back. I came back from the gym. I almost I think I almost died at the gym today. <laughs> <laughs> because my personal trainer is kicking the shit out of me. So I am completely not in shape, Dennis. So you have nothing to worry about. Tommy Dreamer is my personal that. trainer. I had, no, I had no choice but to get up. And I, I got to be honest, like, I don't know if you timed it, but that's got to be a world record for doing a number two that quick. That's got to be a world record. And I wiped. I'm I mean, you. <laughs> I think that's the perfect way to end this show. All right, wrestling perspective. Find us wherever large you'll be going on tour. Jeff Cobb interview. We'll hit those dates later. Yes. Uh, thank you. We missed you guys, and we'll do two podcasts this week just to say we missed you. We love you. Wrestling perspective. Dave Lagreca. Thank you, buddy. Well, you got to do two podcasts because if it's I'm the only guest that you have this week, your fans are going to be very, very upset. <laughs> but they're just happy we got a show this week. <laughs> and welcome home, Lars. We missed you.